All right, part three with uh, Dirty Jeremy Scahill and his book Wars. Every, every part we, we move on here, it just gets raunchier and raunchier. Yes, Dirty Wars. And Jer- Jeremy Scahill. Yes, Jeremy Dirty War Scahill. Right. That's my new thing. Uh, we I used to just be called the Blackwater guy. Like everyone, just anybody who knew me. Oh, you're the Blackwater guy. All right, Mr. Blackwater guy. Um, we're talking about drones. How many drone programs are there in the world? How many? How many countries have uh, killing drones? Oh, how many use yeah. them? I mean, over 70 nations in the world have the capability to use weaponized drones. They haven't necessarily done it yet, um, or or fully developed it, but they have the technology. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of time before drones become a very common part of uh, of all societies, law enforcement or military arsenals. I mean, I know there's been some discussion of it in uh, in Germany. I think yeah. the German public is uh, is weary of uh, of using them, but I do think that it's just a matter of time before drones become a very commonly used uh, weapon uh, of the police. At first, it'll be the police. Well, at first, I think it'll be without the missiles on it. You know, most drones are, do not have missiles on them. Most surveillance, drones are used surveillance, for surveillance drone. right? Yeah. They can be used for surveillance. They also can be. You, you can attach a device to the bottom of a drone that allows it to suck up all of the data from from below. So, and there's another program called the Global Hawk program. Germany actually has been trying to get. They wanted to get a, uh, a Global Hawk and to call it the Euro Hawk. Yeah, they, they failed miserably. And they failed. They failed absolutely miserably. But the U.S. uses this Global Hawk. So the primary use of these drones is for surveillance, which is so you could see how it's uh, how it'd be appealing to law enforcement if you're tracking drug dealers or you're you're looking for people that are running a. a a ring of uh, of thieves or smuggling or something, and you're using the drone to monitor their communications or to monitor their locations. You know, it's a surveillance tool. So that's how it's first going to be introduced into societies. We're already using them in the U.S. for law enforcement. They're going to start to use them on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, I, I predict that if I talk to you in 10 years, uh, Germany will have started using drones in some capacity in a law enforcement way. So it's, you know, it always starts with something that you try to justify it to the public uh, and it's, you make it sound reasonable and logical, but it really is part of a paramilitarization of law enforcement. In the, in the U.S. right now, the U.S. military donates its old weapons to uh, police forces. And so police forces increasingly look like paramilitary organizations in the U.S. Uh, so I think my prediction is that in most of these countries, it'll start domestically. They'll use the drones Right. With the police or federal police or something, FBI type uh, agencies. But, uh, what about killing programs, like uh, killing drone programs, where uh, uh, they meet on Terror Tuesday and decide who 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 gets killed? Is there just one program uh, in in America, or are, are there many? Yeah, I mean, my understanding is that there are three, at least three separate kill lists. One, three, three. So one is maintained by the CIA. One is maintained by the military's Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC, which is this elite commando unit, the guys who killed Osama bin Laden. And then the third is maintained by what, what's called the National Security Council, which is basically the civilian leadership of the executive branch of government, the president, vice president, secretary of state, secretary of defense, and then they have a big staff. Um, and, and there are regular meetings to sort of compare the three kill lists. But uh, you know, I've been told that there have been cases where the CIA has uh, uh, someone who's not on their kill list that they're trying to cultivate as a source or an asset or trying to flip them so they give the U.S. information. And JSOC, this military force, has that person on their kill list. And then they go and kill this person that the CIA was actually trying to get to work with America. So there's, you know, they work at cross purposes sometimes. But yeah, there are three kill lists and there are different rules for the CIA and for the military. You know, the military is pursuing an individual across a border of a country. They can go into that country and kill them. CIA is, uh, you know, bound by sort of different rules and... I mean, the whole thing is uh, is is like a, a labyrinth, you know. Trying to understand it's very difficult. So uh, we 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 a couple of minutes ago we already took a look forward uh, into the future. Do you think there's going to be a drone arms race, like uh, with Germany getting um, killing drones, China, Russia, and all that? I mean, not Germany, not so. I mean, I think I, I sort of view Europe. I mean, Europe. I think European nations um, are really uh, caught between two trends. On the one hand. I think the governments of Europe are are increasingly interested in the advanced technology of their militaries. I'm not exactly sure what national security threats are they're perceiving, but um, you, it seems pretty clear that there's great interest in the technology of war. And Germany certainly has tried at times to get into it with the United States. And you talked about the Eurohawk that failed, but I think you can see that trend is there. And then, there, but they're also kind of uh, Concern that that America is 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 stretching its uh, wars so far, and um, European public opinion is very much against them. So I don't know that I see an arms race that involves Europe and the United States, but certainly China and Russia, no question. 
Um, Iran, I think, would love to develop a, a drone. Um, I mean, I think it's just a matter of time before, my prediction it would be more Russia or China to do it, one of those nations starts using the drones. And if, they're, if they were doing what the U.S. is doing right now, the U.S. would be raising hell about it in the world and talking about lawlessness and assassination and all this stuff. But with the U.S., it's about defending you know, democracy and freedom for the world. So it's wrong when the other guy does it? Uh, or, or, or unlawful? Yeah, I mean, well, look at how the U.S. views international law. Uh, you know, it's uh, how, how do they view it? I don't know. I don't read books. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I, I keep forgetting who I'm talking to. Um, uh, does America recognize the International uh, uh, Criminal Court? No. No? No, the, the U.S. does not recognize the International Criminal Court. It refuses to ratify it. <clears throat> the view of the, of the U.S. government under both Obama and Bush is that international law and the International Criminal Court is for other countries, war criminals. Uh, and in fact, in the 1990s, um, you were a kid then, but in the 1990s, there was a man named Bill Clinton who was president of the United States. And there was discussion when he was president of, uh, of the U.S. actually accepting the International Criminal Court. And, and when that discussion started, there were lawmakers in our Congress who said that if this happens, we will pass a law called the Hague Invasion Act that says that if U.S. personnel are ever taken to the Hague to be prosecuted for war crimes, the U.S. military can invade the Hague and rescue them. You know? Seriously? Yeah. yeah, the Hague Invasion Act. So, so that, that, that's just to give you a, sort of a, a picture of how this is viewed in the United States. It's, it's for people from Rwanda, Yugoslavia, you know, banana republics, but not for Henry Kissinger you know, uh, or not for Donald Rumsfeld. You know? So uh, there's one set of rules for the U.S. and another set of rules for the rest of the world, for the U.S. and its allies, and another set of rules for the rest of the, the world. So, so the, uh, American war criminals don't go to jail. They, they, uh, they get Nobel Peace Prizes. They get Nobel Pre Peace Prizes. And, and contracts. And, and those who uh, uncover uh, war crimes uh, get, get to go to jail. They, yes. I mean, I can tell you a story right now. The, the main guy from the CIA who was running the torture program under Bush was a guy named Jose Rodriguez. He's on book tour right now, uh, selling his book that sounds like a porno book. It's called Hard Measures. <laughs> I got to talk to him. <laughs> you should talk to him. He would be awesome. And, you know, he, he, he says things like, you know, he talks like this. You know, we had to, uh, after 9-11, some of us had to put on our big boy pants. Like our big boy pants. <laughs> like, like you would tell a little kid who's not, learning to, you know, to use the bathroom without a diaper. Like, we, we had to grow up. Time to put on your big boy pants, Johnny. So he says, you know, he's talking about torture, but we had to put on our big boy pants. And he was running the torture program. He's on book tour in the United States right now. Donald Rumsfeld is on a book tour right now. But John Kiriakou, a CIA guy who blew the whistle on torture, is serving a prison sentence right now. Um, Thomas Drake, who blew the whistle on NSA abuses, uh, they charged him under the Espionage Act. He's now working at an Apple store at the Genius Bar. He was a career military officer who followed all the rules and complained within the system. And they tried to put him in jail. They failed to get him in jail, but they ruined his life. He's at a, working at the Apple store now. I mean, it's, it's, he's an older man. It's, a, it's kind of crazy. Edward Snowden, you know, the, who leaked all these NSA papers, is living in Her, Moscow. Heard of him. He's living in Moscow right now. And, uh, you know, they've indicted him under the Espionage Act. And then uh, the soldier formerly known as Bradley Manning, now known as Chelsea Manning, who was behind all the WikiLeaks documents, uh, is serving a prison sentence now in a military prison in the U.S. And the people who ran the torture program around the world and destroyed Iraq are political commentators on TV or are writing books or on the boards of big corporations making millions of dollars. Do you think uh, the, the re people responsible for torture, like um, Dick Cheney and uh, Donald Rumsfeld, George Bush, will they ever be uh, prosecuted for, to for torture? Not, not or for war crimes? Not by the U.S. Um, you know, there were efforts in Germany. There's a, a great uh, human rights lawyer in Germany named Wolfgang Kalik. And he's been working with American lawyers to try to bring a criminal case against Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney. And uh, my understanding is that Rumsfeld actually uh, uh, changed plans. He was supposed to come to Germany at one point, but was concerned that uh, this uh, legal case against him would actually be accepted. So, I mean, you look at what happened with Pinochet, Augusto Pinochet, the former dictator of Chile. You know, when he was detained in Britain. I mean, this Europe, Europe has a much more progressive idea about this that... Uh, uh, doesn't accept that the United States or its allies should be held to a different standard. They still are subservient to the demands of the U.S., but the public, I think, is more inclined to say that there should be an even application of, uh, uh, of the law. But there were also NATO officials <clears throat> during the 1999 NATO bombing. Uh, you know, Germany, uh, the United States, Britain were involved with all sorts of war crimes in the 78-day bombing of Yugoslavia, um, and none of them were ever held responsible for it.
Um, you know, I mean, NATO was bombing civilian infrastructure. They killed journalists. They blew up a, a green market in the middle of the day. Uh, I mean, you could also make a case that there were probably German officials involved with bombings in uh, Yugoslavia that should have been held accountable for what they were doing. But I, w I was going to ask that. Uh, do you have any knowledge uh, knowledge of um, German American corporation that? Uh involved w war crimes well i mean I'm, what i'm talking about is a is a bombing that was done under the auspices of nato yeah. that involved the major powers of europe attacking yugoslavia over the kosovo issue and i was there on the ground covering it you don't necessarily know whose aircraft is doing the bombing what i'm saying is that nato writ large committed war crimes in yugoslavia and its bombings who specifically was sitting in the cockpit of the planes or firing the missiles, we don't know. But all of these governments were working together. So if it was thoroughly investigated and we determined who was responsible for what bombings, it's possible that it was German officials or U.S. officials or British officials. I don't know a specific case of Germans being involved with it, but they were involved with an operation where a lot of war crimes were committed, and it's never been investigated. Uh, you mentioned earlier that... Um European countries still kind of do what Amer America wants them to do. Is, is this, uh, do you consider this an empire? Like, is, is America, uh, is there still an American empire? Yeah, I think, I mean, Pax Americana? Well, pa no, it's not Pax Americana. I mean, I, th I think, I think there's something resembling an empire. The problem, I mean, it's an interesting question because with technology, it makes it easier to exert your dominance and it also makes it harder to maintain it. Um, You know, because uh, there's a democratization of information that uh, that didn't exist during the time of prior empires. So I think that's a complicated question. I think the U.S. perceives itself as an empire, um, but I think it's uh, it's in a real crisis as to how to continue to, to dominate. Um, so I don't know how to answer that question, but the U.S. definitely perceives itself as an empire. It's a, it's a different empire. Like I, I remember when the last soldiers from Iraq came home, and um, Amer uh, Obama gave a like a homecoming address, and he said, "Unlike the old empires, yeah, yeah, yeah. we do it because it's right." <laughs> so is it like whenever America does something, therefore it's right? Oh yeah. I mean, if you think about it, if you when you declare your country, I mean, when we're, when we're kids in school growing up. Um, We're taught that not only is America the greatest country in the world, it's the greatest country in the history of civilization. If they, if they discover life on another planet, it doesn't matter what that life is. We, we are greater than any civilization they've had on that planet. I mean, that's, how, that's what you're taught as a kid. So, what, so if, you, if that's your perception, you can justify doing anything around the world in defense of that society because it's this great shining light you know, for the rest of the world. And, and so someone like Barack Obama comes into office, people have this idea that he's somehow different. It, you have to be a radical American exceptionalist and a pretty militant American nationalist to be president of the United States. Do you think there's, uh, what, or let's say, will the ever, will, mm -hmm. Think this one through. Okay. Who, who Use your words carefully. What do you think comes earlier, an atheist U.S. president or uh, a pacifist, pacifist U.S. <laughs> US president? Wow, that those are such two reprehensible uh, uh, worldviews from the perspective of the American corporate elite. Um, I I would be shocked if uh, if an atheist was ever elected president in anything vaguely resembling my lifetime, or you know, if I ever have grandkids, my grandkids' lifetime. I mean, it's uh, it's like a non-starter. Mitt Romney, you know, who is running for president, is a Mormon. And, you know, a lot of the evangelical Christians just viewed him as like a cultist. I mean, he might as well have run saying, you know, I'm, I pledge to bring Satan into the White House. And they would have been like, oh, okay, it's great compared to being a Mormon. Right. Um, a pacifist? That, that will never happen. I mean, I, so I would, I would say that probably it's more likely for an atheist to be president than a pacifist. Um, but I, I don't think either of them will happen in our lifetime at all or the lifetime of grandchildren or anything, you know. Right. Um, that Thanks. Uh, that's we got one part left.